We are going to talk who I talk with Josh a bit. We have been through our 15 years program, and we are, we are going to, uh, if you have any problem with my English, please, uh, it's a little worse than it used to be after uh, 12 days of hard code. You know, the drivers here in the morning. I used to get a rise and go to the beach and sail for two hours and get a cable. <laughs> Shovel, snow for two hours. <laughs> 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 it was worse. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we decided that it's supposed to talk a little more about the relationship between the different actors uh, in a different phase of the project, the relationship among these actors and our goals, then go to, into specific to the methodology or the citations. I'm open to discussing another time about those specific things. Uh, we decided that we should try to go through the whole uh, relationship between us researchers, the farmers, and the government, and how this program became a statewide uh, policy. So uh, if you have any doubt, just you know, uh, ask me for the details. This is it's a program from, it's called a Patch Outreach Program from the University of Santa Catarina. The university is in this beautiful island, 10 miles long, 7 miles wide. And the program ended up being called by the farmers, by Huazan Grazing Group. You guys are going to notice that the first 10 years that we have been working is more related to farm livelihood through agroecologic pasture-based production. And then we start with uh, 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 being a bit more aggressive towards forest restoration altogether. <coughs> but anyway, uh, the university always support us, and it was a program, uh, what's called an extension program from the university. Uh, the university is it's quite big, <coughs> 2,000 students, 29 undergrads, you know, 1,800 uh, faculties. Uh, have been, in the last nine years, as you can see, we kind of increased 30%. So that's, that's Brazil, you know, everything's growing, growing. Quality control, it's not that better, but it just keep growing. It's amazing. Um, <coughs> university is quite big. The campus is 3,000, 3.9 thousand acres. It's a huge area. Here's downtown, Florianópolis downtown is the city. And most of the island is, you know, bits like this. Downtown, it's like some, a slice of Sao Paulo, a slice of New York. <coughs> but, you know, everything else is quite pristine and uh, still very enjoyable. Uh, let me show you. Joshua used to live here. Joe used to live on the Red Star. <laughs> so, you know, it was nice. Uh, just going a little bit about Brazil, you know, our population is 6% of the United States. Our size is the same size of the mainland of the United States. Uh, our GDP is barely 3,000 trillions. And this last week, a week, two weeks ago, the Economist published an article that our president was trying to change the economics to make our <coughs> GDP sounds a little better than what we did was. <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's part of our culture, also happened quite a lot. Something that I, uh, I like it is that we have in Brazil 377 Americans living in Brazil, and 2,051 Brazilians living in America. We also, Brazilian population doesn't like to spend much money on the <laughs> so it's our staff to get through uh, the population and without anything. However, Brazil exports lots of airplanes, war, uh, war material, quite a lot, cars and computers. We also have uh, at least 20% of our population that have a couple of two meals a day still yet, it's like that. And it's a kind of a uh, very controversial country, you know, it's most of uh, it's the seventh, it's the seventh growth economy. It's also probably the third uh, growing uh, economy in the world. We are growing quite a lot. Uh, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it's 
hard for Americans or for someone that lives in developed countries to understand those idiosyncrasies, like the accident that happened a couple of weeks ago. Can you imagine that a, a, a house show has emergence doors painted on the wall, but there was no door. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, that's a little bit of Brazil also. So, it's kind of very, very paradoxical country, but it's warm people, you know. Uh, so here we have like the 26 states, Santa Catarina is the state that we are working, that uh, the university is located, it's this little state here could be called it you know, green mountain state. It's just mountains, green, lots of mountains, lots of forests, and family farms. Uh, the main biomas in Brazil is the Amazon, 50%, and then the Caatinga, Cerrado, Atlantic Forest, and south, in the, here in the south, uh, so, uh, pa native pasture, and here, Pantanal, it's a big swamp area. So, um, the Amazon is what people you know, know uh, related most with Brazil and I understand that if you get a little airplane and fly for hours and look everywhere and you just see trees. That's quite amazing, you know, everybody gets like, wow, look at that. And you pop 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 and the airplane doesn't stop and you look at trees, pop 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 after two hours trees. <laughs> uh, people get really impressed about this fifty percent of our country also have a semi arid area called Caatinga. Our corn <coughs> belt is the Cerrado, used to be a savanna, now it's most uh, corn and soybean area. And then down here we have the Pampa, which is a native pasture area. And here, uh, Atlantic Forest. The Atlantic Forest is where we are located. Uh, it's one of the most endangered <coughs> forests in the world. 68% of the Brazilian population live in this area. 78% of our GDP comes from here, the Atlantic Forest. Uh, you know, big cities, Rio, Sao Paulo, Curitiba, Salvador, most that you have heard are in the Atlantic Forest. The provision of, you know, the basic ecosystem service for this area is absolutely important and we end up just with 7.8% of the forest poverty. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's really, uh, very, very important issue to deal with how Brazilians are going to, uh, at <coughs> this point in time, we have to restore the forest. I don't think, I don't think that is sustainable anymore. That's my personal opinion. You know, we, seven to eight percent, we are living from the seeds that are in the soil from many years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the animals are not the same. The, the many remnants are really poor. So, I think soon we are going to have a bigger problem to deal with. And Santa Catarina is this small state where we are working. Uh, our area is four times Vermont. Our population is 10 times Vermont population. Our GDP, 78 billion. Vermont, 25.9 billion. Egg GDP, it's around 12, 13% of our overall GDP. Uh, and Santa Catarina is <coughs> together with the Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Catarina, Rio Grande do Sul, Paraná, São Paulo, Minas Gerais, this area here is where the whole <coughs> uh, most populated areas in Brazil are all in this area we call South and Southeast. Uh, talking a little bit about Brazil, since we are going to talk about dairy farmers, Brazil is the fifth milk producer in the world. Uh, we have grew quite a lot. We came from 10 to 5th in 4 years. And we have lots of room to grow. And I don't know if it's good or bad. My perception is <coughs> that's good. But yes, our production is very slow compared with uh, China and Russia. So, uh, our cows produce 1,000 kilos a year, most around the world, 3,000 kilos of milk a year, so we have a lot of food to grow. And I can't see that Brazil is going to be one of the major milk production, in produ productions in the world in the coming years, for sure. Uh, that's a big thing. Most of our milk is directed to internal market, 
three years we started exporting the last three years and we are already among the main milk exporters so uh, you know it's like uh, 30 years ago in America everything happened so fast uh, I think we are living that in Brazil we also live in a nice economic bubble but <laughs> <coughs> Santa Catarina is among the five states that produce 75% of this milk production. 83% of this milk production is produced by family farmers. They produce 7% of state agricultural goods. Everything that you eat comes from family farmers. And it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, uh, structure from America. It's very common. France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal. Everything that we eat comes from family farms. Chicken, swine, beans, rice, all the greens. It's all come from most from family farms. A little bit of uh, corn. Most of big farmers work with soybean and corn to feed livestock. But for us, it's really important uh, that the Santa Catarina and Brazilian population understand that who feeds our people are still family farmers. Your family farmer, is that defined by a size or just owned by a family? Uh, we have uh, three criteria. The criteria that you're using here, that the farm should not be bigger than 50 acres. Most of the income should come from the farm. And the labor should come also from family. So that's one of the, the, the criteria. Is that the criteria that I also, we also have been using. Santa Catarina, 80% of the family farmers are landowners. And 61% have less than 40 acres. I mean, we are talking about small farms, hard to, to live with. So economic feasibility of those farms, it's a major state concern. It's related to rural and urban migration. It's a very important social issue for us. You know? It's not a question of economics anymore. Long ago, we used to say, you know, the most efficient stays on the land. Who is not efficient, look, go out. It's not anymore. Brazilian population have treated family farm in a different way, and you have to improve that. It's much more than just making money. It's a social problem. Uh, around my town, we have many sl uh, slums, neighborhoods, you know, with the, we call favelas. And one of them, uh, Chico Mendes, is 3,000 people, and you walk them and most of them dress like a dairy farmers mm -hmm. and they have been there for seven years and all of them drink shimahang which is very common in the countryside you know they talk about the life in the countryside most of them have a little garden and they still have this you know melancholic way of thinking how good was life in the countryside mm -hmm. and you know the kids are going to get involved with drug dealers because they don't have no job for all these people when we started our program in 1996, Brazil had 1.9 million dairy farmers. By 1999, it was 1.2 million. So uh, during these three years, this is just when we start working in Brazil. You know, we start working in 1998. And 600, uh, six, uh, 630,000 dairy farmers have been left during these three years from the countryside, half of that went to urban areas. And we are talking here about 2.4 million people displaced socially from the countryside. So when we started, when I uh, went back to Brazil, it was 97, 98, was a big thing. You know, we used, it was very hard to get a smile from a farm. All of them would stand still in front of you, hug you, shake hands, but all of them with that you know, deep feeling that they are in bad shape and they're going to run out, out of business. And that's not new. That's what happened here in America. And most of them tried to work with semi confinement using uh, lots of corn, lots of silage, lots of machinery. They could not compete with the big farms. That's what happened with them. Plus, a huge environmental impact. These are very old pictures, and most of them, you know. This is Seolau. Seolau is still work with us. In the last 15 years, I can't remember that the first two years, one of my students said, what happened to Salah? He doesn't smile. <laughs> and he said, yes, he doesn't smile. It smiles quite a lot now, Ajo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he used, when he started work with us, 
1998, and he was running out of business. When he started to work with us, he was paying to produce milk for three years. And people ask, how someone would pay to produce? I mean, he had the, the, the cows, he had the farm, he cannot do anything else, he's a farmer, dairy farmer. So he, if he has some money in the bank, he's going to go through the end, that's for sure. Because he just waits for the next cycle. That's what happened with farmers, you know, they just keep waiting to the next cycle to further. And when they decided that they cannot do that anymore, it's just too late. They are up to here with that. And, and so Laura was just on time to leave. And that I would say that one of the most reasons why they decided to work with the pasture, agroecological pasture based production. We are going to talk about a few of those phases. This is the beginning when we start working. Then we start work with the organic, it was around 2000. And then in 2004, we became a statewide program. And 2008, we start being a little more aggressive with the forest restoration on our projects, and the farmers decide to do so. And this one that I engraved here are programs that we start and we stop it because they were in a different areas than the, the, the green part of our program. So we start working in Santa Rosa de Lima. It's, it's a little town, 3,000 people, uh, just in between two state parks, one park is here and another one is here. 3,000 people, uh, one paved road, a guy's station at the beginning of the road, a guy's station at the end of the road. One is from the Republican, the other one is from Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two parties on the town. So when we start working there, the mayor said, you know, make sure that you get your gas in the first gas station, all right? <laughs> so they okay. And then you have a hard time to switch from one to the other. You didn't want to, to uh, get involved in this uh, situation. So it's not more than 100, uh, 100, uh, 100 meters one street town. <coughs> However, uh, they have a very strong association called the Greco, Agroecologic Farm Association of Serra Geral, and they not, they, they heard about us and, and start talking with us. Uh, we have been there a few times in 1998, and then they sent a couple of farmers to talk with, with the university people. Many people rejected because of snow, five acre farm, four acre farm, seven acre farm, and you know, uh, I thought it could be a nice adventure to work in this kind of setup. We did have a very strong problem in our department because we could not get paid for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So yes, the university in the beginning uh, didn't like much. And the state extension <coughs> agents also didn't like the university getting involved with small farms. So here we are working with Agreco. Our mentor was Bill Murphy from PSS. He, I worked with him in the past outreach program at the Vermont, University of Vermont, and I was here. And uh, for sure, he was our, when we left here, he said, you know, if you want to make our country a little different, don't work with the big guys. The big guys pay quite well, believe me. And they know what agroecological production and pasture-based production. And so we start working with small family farmer. Our main goal was we think family dairy systems in Santa Catarina. When I told the first to, when I told our goal for the extension, state agents, they said, no, you guys come from the United States, they all have, with the accent from the coastal area. And you think that you're going to rethink dairy systems? Come on. What we are doing is what's supposed to work. Just, they thought it was quite presumption, uh, probably was. <laughs> but the whole idea was participatory hands-on action towards sustainable option, pasture-based dairy. Uh, we work in a very, you know, participatory research action center. Everything was discussed with the farmers, and we would not move a meter if it wasn't uh, the way that uh, if, the, if the farmers decide not to do so. And that sometimes was a problem, because our time, 
our time as a university people is quite different from the time the people that live in the countryside. You know, sometimes a farmer takes two years to decide if he's going to work with the pasture, with the agricultural or not. Sometimes it takes three years. And for us, you know, we have to write our reports. <laughs> and you know, we have just... You know, and that for me, for sure, was our big uh, challenge. Try to share our movements and our decisions with farmers. Well, that was tough. I was not trained to do that. So uh, here we started. Uh, I'm going <coughs> to share with you a couple of perceptions. First, the farmers had serious problem of depression. They had no hope at all. <coughs> Second, they were certain that pasture-based dairy was technically impossible. Was, they are so sure that one farmer told me, you know, you're a nice guy. I have been here 62 years. I know that's not going to work. But you know, you can do it. Get that part of the farm and do what you want. And the other farm told me, you know, um, <coughs> I'm going to leave the post with me and all the fencing and the water system. I said, yeah, sure. So, wow, good. So you can do it. Let's do it. Because uh, we try to share with them what have at, at that point what had been done in America. They have no way to go. They're hopeless. So they said, you know, let's do it. We had no option. And that's what I call participatory. Uh, it's very hard to have someone with you that doesn't have the experience that you have before. For them, it was sure that it would not work. For sure. They were absolutely 100% that, you know, they're just a favor. They are, they are doing a favor for the university people. So that's okay. <laughs> uh, we also have intense social pressure, and that's, I think, was a big problem also in the beginning, because when the priests call the farmers that we work with, they go, oh, you guys are crazy. Are you smoking something? Drinking? I and mean, you get involved with these people that come from, you know, urban area. They are going to teach you guys to do something? What's the point? You know, we are trying to do something, something together as an experiment. So one of our farmers, uh, uh, João, this fellow that's here in the middle, said, no, I stopped going to the church because all the time was, was kind of pain when I start working with pasture-based dairy. Uh, also, the cherry, you know, said, call me. I mean, he didn't call me. He sent me, as, as you say, a petition that I have. I mean, I was an hour and a half from this town. He sent me a petition that I should <coughs> present myself in his town. And I didn't know what's going on. I thought that was speed limit, anything, you know. <laughs> then I got there, I said, no, this electric fencing thing is not going to work in our town. <laughs> Just do it somewhere else. Here, no way. And you know, we're just trying to produce milk on pasture, agroecologic, and you know, we have no way to do it. If you do not work with the electric fence, well, that's not going to work. So we took Cherif, I spent like a couple of days with him around, visit many farmers, and then he said, all right, let's do it. <laughs> uh, another thing that was quite annoying for us that these governmental institutions, <coughs> the state institutions, in the beginning, uh, boycott our work very, you know, you know it's not going to work. Even now, when Joey was there, we are doing high biodiversity pastoralism. Folks from the state agents get around and try to offer different things to the farmer. It's always a little uh, annoying. That's the way that it is. The structural model, model was the UVM partial to each program. So, uh, most of farms that we are working here, it's kind of steep slope, really. These three guys are the same size. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and this was 1998. So it's really like, they, we used to put the posts on this wheelbarrow and bring up to the hill with the, with the hopes, you know, get the one hope up there and then someone would walk down <laughs> and push the cart up to the hill. And here we are setting up a, a grazing plan on his farm and fencing off the repairing areas. And his farm used to look like this in the beginning. And then here, as you guys can see, all the manure concentration. We work with something called high stocking density. We try to improve 
soil diversity through manure. I mean, those past 100 years degradation, are under 100 years degradation process. In many areas, there was no pasture at all. Most with one species, most resilient species, and the soil was as bad as you can imagine. So, uh, in this farm, was our first farm, and luckily, here as you can see, these grasses are most related with the manure patches, you know? And then, in a year, got quite different. And in the beginning, this, uh, most of people around, around the area said, you know, these guys are using some kind of different fertilizer, mm. you know, maybe different seed, because the pasture architecture changed, changed quite a lot, also with the management. So they all, you know, uh, I was invited to be mayor in one of the town. They thought that <laughs> kind of uh, Jesus trying to... Because we are talking about a farm. Look, this is João's farm. This is a year. And, you know, it's just nature. It's just let nature do. And don't be a problem for the relationship between nature and the animals. Hey, can you see here a tree? This is the tree and a log. And a lot. It's, it's not a year between the two pictures, you know. So, uh, like Juan was selling 50 pounds milk a day and started selling 352, and nothing, uh, <coughs> nothing unusual about that. First, Juan was so bad that was any, you know, anything that you do it would, would look great. Mm. First, uh, was you know. Dialoguing with nature, giving the rest period that the passion needs, giving the organic matter the passion needs. We didn't work with any chemical <coughs> fertilizer be besides natural phosphates. So, and changed quite a lot. So, when we finished, here we are in 2000, these people said, No, wow, this is just amazing. And by this time, João was giving speeches. <laughs> you know, first he was a crazy farmer that was dealing with us. In two years, he was giving speeches. Many people were visiting his farm. So we changed quite uh, a lot for two years. It was quite impressive. Uh, but at this time, most of farmers thought it was some special technology, you know, that you brought from America. It's hard for someone to think that's just uh, uh, understand nature can do that. So can do that improve, kind of improvement. It was real. It was just. You know, rest, what we call resting time, and high stocking density. So simple. And water, and not allow the cows to go to the streams. It was so simple and so powerful. But they still, at this point in time, they were thinking that was something that was not affordable, affordable for everybody else. You might just quickly explain what it exactly is you do with that um, voice on grazing. Mm -hmm. I don't yes. know how many people would not have a clue what that. Yes. Do you it's, get to that later? Yeah. Sure. No, it's. Uh, well, can you use the board? Yeah, no, it's not necessary. What we do is was and grazing most of the time. We get the pasture and divide it in as many paddock as we need as a recovery time for the pasture. So if you need eight days, uh, five days of recovery time, here could be our, our grazing setup. We have six paddocks with rest for five days and the sixth day would come for the first paddock. Most of the time we work with 40 paddocks. And you give this area a rest of 40 days, 31 days, depend on the situation. That, uh, who wrote first about this was uh, a French science, scientist called Voisin, André Voisin, in 1957. <coughs> and he had been done in Cuba and Ireland and New Zealand since then. He died in Cuba in 1963, if I'm not wrong. But of course, Brazil, at this point in time, we are working with same confinement. All our teachers uh, used to come to Wisconsin, learn how to confine cows and go back to Brazil. Tropical weather, pasture all year round, you know. It was just hard for the teachers to understand that our country needed something different. So, makes sense for them. Most of the time we have paddocks, and that's why we end up setting, fencing off the streams and controlling a bit the grazing intensity because we could work with the cows in the time and the pasture. And that would change from pasture to pasture 
and also depend of how many species we have in our pasture. So here we are in the second stage of our, of our program. And here the goal was work with organic farms, not just pasture-based farms. Work with 15 organic farms, 15 more pasture-based, and start with a dairy co-op that would uh, work just with organic milk. Because we have, it's always complicated. We ask for the farm to produce organic. No one's buy the milk. What he's going to do with the milk? So we got the money and said we needed to do a small dairy plant. Could not be big. So we end up calling family dairy co-op. Five folks. One of them was uh, João, the one that I show you guys. And more four farmers. They set up what they call a geração dairy co-op. And they start, uh, was the first dairy co-op, a certified dairy co-op in Brazil for organic production. And this was between 2000 and 2003. So I'm going to go through this phase quite quickly. By this time, we have a nice team, 23 people, lots of students. Everything was done by the students. By the way, most volunteers had no money to pay a technician. Uh, and most of our, our research was related to the money for the car, for the gas, for the food. Uh, the, uh, city Hall would pay the car, the gas, the food, the university would give the driver uh, and my time and the farmers would give meals and place for the students stay so we did that every weekend, we could not work during the, the weekdays all the students were on the university and the weekdays we would go to the countryside like an hour drive with uh, five and some points with 15 students be on the farms, work with the farms, go back to the university, go back to the next weekend. We did that quite a long time, and oh wow, it was fun. Uh, we have a, a driver that the university provides to work with us, called it Costeirinha, and Costeirinha has this huge depression problem. You know, have all kinds of medicine. And one day he was talking to me, I said, Costeirinha, are you drinking beer? I mean, I knew his problem. I said, no, I haven't taken my medicine anymore because it's so fun to work, come here every weekend. That, and by this time, Costerini was doing farm planning. You know, all his free time he was in our lab doing farm planning. And he, he would go to the countryside and decide everything with the farmers. And it was like, wow, I was like, wow. You know, this guy that was our drive and the relationship between him, myself, and the other students uh, was, was fun, <coughs> quite fun. And he also died in a car accident, as most of the drivers in Brazil end up dying. But anyway, so he works with us quite a lot. Uh, by this time, we, we draw a methodology waiting, with 18 steps. I'm not going to get into that. But the result of this 18 steps methodology after lots of talk, we would measure all the farm with GPS. We get to the six map with the six layers with different issues in each map. First map was the first map was how the farm looked like. That time we would not have a, we have a GPS. We do not have good uh, images from satellites in Brazil for a good price. So and then we do the zoning. Is the riparian area. And then after the zoning, we would work with the paddocks. And then uh, we put that on the imaging. That's uh, the last seven years, 10 years. And then the students would go there and work with the farmers, you know, and do all the fencing. And, and they enjoy it much more than I would imagine. You know, I have no trouble to have volunteers to work with us. Uh, this guy, for, he's João da Rosa, he's the captain of the Brazilian rugby team. So a couple of, couple of weekends a month he would be playing everywhere, but most of the time he worked with us. Uh, and here is what ended up being our experiment in this second phase. And one thing that works quite a lot, that most of our meetings were quite ludic. And I think that was really important, you know, this mixing between playing, laughing, mm -hmm. and also working hard and serious. For the Brazilians, it's a good way to go. You know, you have to be, I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to be drunk or 
besides they love it, all the farmers love caipirinha. <laughs> and you have to, because if you visit five farms, by the end of the day, you will be drunk, because it's caipirinha in every farm. <laughs> so you have to keep saying no, and sometimes if you say no, they don't like it. So, uh, you know, it was a little difficult to think about, about caipirinha and about uh, a, a cake that they like to do it, they call it sonho. You know, you have to drink a caipirinha and eat a sonho, but a sonho, it's a big thing like this, you know? <laughs> Seven during the day, just was a little hard. But it was very important that the whole work was quite ludic, and that's, that, I think, make uh, improve our relationship and also the trust among us. So, uh, by the time that we finish this phase, we have 43 farms, and then, uh, with 43 farms, grass-based production was something that well, the farmers are very comfortable with. Here we are in 2003. All the social actors are very comfortable with that. <coughs> we have like 15 organic fa uh, dairy families working. We have the co-op set up. And you also have what you call many support groups. The support group is like the AA group, you know, when the people get together just to talk about how difficult it is being a farm. So we have this, we learn in New Zealand, and so we have these support groups, they get together every 15 days, and maybe 30% of the time they talk about pasture, most of the time was about how difficult it was to be a farm, and how difficult it was to do something different, and that I think is just the big issue. A farmer to do anything, when a farmer wants to do anything different, was really tough. They would lose a couple of nights of sleep thinking about, man, man do you think that's right? So, by the way, when you start working with these people, if you talk about trees on pasture, they would kick us out of the farm. Because most of them has a German and Italian background. Mm. So, farm and trees are like, you know? <laughs> And also the best soil is the soil of the riparian area. So every time that you talk about complying the law, that was the end of the relationship. So during uh, quite a while, we were, and I used to tell, I have to tell this to the students, please, no, let's don't talk about, about the environmental law, because most of farms use the riparian area. And let's don't talk about, you know, what? The riparian, area. riparian area, that's the best soil, they use but they cannot use it in Brazil. Mm. The Brazilian forest code doesn't allow them to use 15 feet. Meters? Or feet? Or Nine, 90, 90 feet. feet. 90 feet. 90 feet. Yeah, 30 meters. Wow. So uh, by this time, we could work with pests, we could not talk about those issues. That was very sensible issues, and if you want to stop a project, just talk about trees. <laughs> you know, that was, and it happened many times. You know, they start talking as what is called in Brazil, eco chato, eco annoying guy. You know? Eco asshole, right? Eco asshole. Eco asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, it was a kind of a very smooth kind of relationship. And anyway, it took uh, in, 2000, in 2004. The state government decided that, that everything that had happened in this area could be interesting for the state. So they decided to uh, uh, make our project a statewide program. And, and this guy, that's the head of uh, EPAGRI, EPAGRI is the state uh, extension agency. It's a big, it's a huge corporation. Uh, 800. Uh, agronomist and vet, and probably a hundred PhDs. And all these people, they didn't know that it was possible to feed cattle in passion. I mean, it's just hard to accept that. And here he says that, you know, once we recorded, mm -hmm. and he says that, you know, once we visit these projects, we learned that we could feed cows on pasture. I mean, you know, it wasn't, I mean, it's just charges. And then we decided that we could do it. And because of him, we end up doing this nice relationship. And we have uh, many problems at the university because the university people didn't want to see us working for free with the state. Mm -hmm. 
And the state also, they have many problems because the, you know, this lobby thing from the state didn't want them to get involved with agriculture. It's quite of common. Uh, even here in Vermont. So uh, anything that's new, people get scared about and suddenly they become against. So uh, EPAGRI, we work with EPAGRI, four farmers union and four dairy <coughs> groups. EPAGRI has 293 state uh, offices in state towns, 857 agronomists, 103 PhDs and 199 master's degree. It's a huge corporation. When Bora, this guy said, we are going to start to work with pasture dairy, you know, they said, are you crazy? No way. He said, we, we didn't, that's, you know, we, so he took, I think, three or four buses with the extension agent to visit our project. And then after, I think, half a year of conversation, they decided to start on this southern part of the state. Said, no, 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 not the whole state, just do it that little way. <laughs> because they're where we start our program. Anyway, and the farmers are asking for. So they could not avoid. And I have, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it became a state-wide program because the head of EPAGRI knew that it was possible. And it was like, a, you know, this, maybe his perception. Otherwise, would not, I thought that would not work. Said no, said many times, Bora, it's not going to work. We're going to waste our energy. It's not going to work. He used to laugh. He's bigger than Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him, he used to laugh at me and say, No, you don't know the details. <laughs> and okay, suddenly it became a statewide program. And our main goal here is expand the pasture based dairy for the southern Santa Catarina. And then it became a big thing, the whole state, you know. Everybody used to talk about all the state agents <coughs> became, you know, suddenly uh, for the agroecology. And many of them start talking about pasture days, which was great. And at the university, they said, you know, someone, uh, old folk, criticized me in the meeting, said, no, what do you have you done? You just make this pasture day thing so popular. Now everybody does. I said, yeah, but that's what's supposed to happen. Uh, so it's difficult at the university. It's also difficult, you know, uh, at the university you have like a little resistance to get down to the ivory tower and, and the extension also. But after four years of project, we end up with a great relationship. These are all kids that used to be work with us as students. <coughs> Jair Suebi, Adriano Odra, Cesar Bus, Adriano Odra, and Marcelo Pacheco. He's a surfer. One day he got into my office and said, you know, I want to be a agronomist. I'm going to leave my, my degree. I don't know nothing about passion. I said, you know, go and work with Adriano, this guy. Work with Adriano for six months as a trainee. And he has all his other body, arms, all with tattoos. And then he said, you know, what am I going to do with my tattoos? He said, don't worry. You think that the farmers are going to like it? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Joe and Joshua met him. And he's one of the best agronomists. He managed pasture. Wow, as best as can be. It's really good. So it became a, a <coughs> program that involved many young farmers. 621 farmers grazing plan in 53 towns <coughs> became quite popular. By this time, the dairy farm become quite confident about what they are doing. They are very proud because they are doing uh, in a good way. That's really important, you know, when someone says, I'm doing pasture-based dairy, you know? I'm fencing off my stream. I'm, do, I'm doing the transition to be organic. And that, you know, they do. That's, that's really good when a farmer can say that. And they got involved. At some point, it became like a philosophy, you know, like a mm -hmm. seta. How do you call it? Exactly. Yeah, the people are the, the grazers, and they are not grazers. And they used to call themselves more than grazers. And they said, no, let's not be that, you know, let's not draw a line. But uh, at some point, yeah, you know, I'm a pasture based farmer, you are not. <laughs> so, uh, 
but with the time uh, we just, uh, they realized that that was just you know a way to use the soil use the land manage the landscape so he is one of the places that we work uh, he's the same place and uh, we end up getting a prize farm family farm sustainable dairy production in Santa Catarina it's a prize that that was the 18th prize that uh, United Nations giving you know, different programs since 92 was two years before the Rio 20 uh, and the negative side of becoming a statewide program that the farmers the farmers start talking about plowing naturalized pasture maybe using exotic forage to maximize production and they start talking about chemical fertilizer mm -hmm. so from here we that was 2008 we start working <coughs> we know that we are we know that we are here in Santa Catarina, and Atlantic Forest is one of the biodiversity hotspots. We know that we are among the eight hottest, hottest biodiversity hotspots. Here is Brazil, Atlantic Forest. We have been thought about this during 10 years, and in 2008 we said, you know, from now on we are going to work with farmers that want to do forest work with the farm as a whole, recovery, repairing areas, restore the forest and also work with voice and silk pastoralism and when we decided to do that we decided with four more farmers and for me it was was i said wow if you have five farmers that's enough and then from from this point we start let me jump from the end here we got money from this soccer team to give the seedlings to the farmers because the farmers and the money came from Visa. <laughs> so uh, we start recovering the riparian areas. That was the first challenge. How we are going to help the farmers to comply with the Brazilian forest code. So we got the seedlings. We talked with the farmers. And they decided, we decided that the only way to do it is working. Uh, if work in the riparian areas with what we call working forests forests that would produce no timber forest value. So we start with this and then we change for another phase. When I used to be a biologist for three years, I worked with uh, Ademir Hayes, and Ademir Hayes worked with the forest restoration and has this theory called nucleation. A quarter of an acre with lots of species, and from that quarter of an acre, the biodiversity would go to the other areas of the forest in order to restore the forest. So we got all these principles and end up what we call, uh, we talked quite a lot to the farmers to decide how to do it. And this time, uh, Joshua helped us with a, a speech. Uh, this researcher, he was thinking quite a lot. <laughs> So we thought and think and decided what we could do it to, uh, to that's what the farmers go. 20% of shade, they said yes. What do you want? 20% of shades on our farm, on our pasture, make extra money, you know, trade off are not enough, they said it's straight on our face. Trade off, no way, we need to make money. If you're gonna make money, you're gonna work with civil pastoralism, otherwise no way. So we start we, our main goal, 20% of shade, make extra money, increase biodiversity, and maybe think about payments for ecosystem service. So I'm finished. So we start working what we call high biodiversity, was and pastoralism, uh, 50 small islands, 15 by 15 feet, on the paddocks. On those islands, we have 18 species, and many of them are directed to the production of no timber forest value. Our main goal here are to produce acai fruits from these eight palm trees and 
And by the way, that uh, after like a four six months of participatory discussion, we decided that it would be our pilot project. 18 here are acai plants, here are pioneering plants, here a fruit, uh, a tree for bee flowers, here native bee house, and here one climax tree, and here a place for the birds, and also here two other places. So we could take this fence out of here and put inside. And we had we built these 50 little islands in the acre area of the pasture. The farmers, when when we decided to do so, we have this folk that the Silvio that I show you that now he's 72 years old. He got me and said, "No, I want to be the first pilot project." And then I look at him and say, I show some water. He said, yes, I want to be. My, my project is going to be the first one. OK, could you help me with that? I said, I don't know. The group's going to decide it. But you know, you show up, say, I want it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and he did it. And the group decided that he could be his first project. And now we have, we got the trees, we planted. We have like here a nucleus with two and a half years already. Joe helped us to do a couple of them. And the whole idea, and also Joshua, the whole idea is get after four years, we're going to get the palm trees with fruits. And from this, the farmers are going to get an extra $800 per hectare, which is almost half of the naked milk. And after all, I, I, I ask myself, why you never thought about that? So what? It was so simple. It was in our face. You could not see it. And I think that's what agroecology is about. And I, al I always think about John Todd, because you know, we just have to try to open ourselves to nature knowledge, and also the ancient knowledge. The native people used to drink acai juice. Why you never thought about that? Most of the time, because we have European farmers. They don't like trees. But then they worked with us for 10 years. They said, oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Voisin, pasture work quite well. Let's go to civil pastoralism. So, uh, the Euterpe Pedulis, which is this tree, was uh, 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 one of our trees that are uh, with problem with ex was in the list of the endangered species, most because we take we kill plants to get to get the heart from the plant, and now. If we are going to work with the fruits, we don't need it to kill the plant anymore. We harvest every year three bunches, each bunch two kilos. So, you know, and we also got the food chain of the Euterpe polyracea from the north of Brazil. Uh, and I'm not going to get into it, but here is the acai thing uh, that's being sold here in Amazonia. So here we work. Uh, our main goal now is work with silk pastoralism with no timber products. One of them is acai, another one is sanguidi dragon, which is a fungi uh, produced from a plant. We also uh, work with different fruits and native bees, 50 little islands per hectare. That's, that's what we are doing, we, what we have done in the last five years with the help of Joshua and Joe. <coughs> I think that's all. Sorry for the confusion. Mm -hmm. So I have two quick questions. One, <coughs> what was the grazing system before this, as opposed to pastoralism? Were they not yeah. grazing? Mm -hmm. Yes, they were doing what Americans used to do it and what broke the American farms. Yeah. Most of the feed was, was silage yeah. from mm -hmm. corn. Okay. But I have to tell you, they, are not, they weren't as good as the Americans. Yeah. They produced very low. OK, so it was sort of silage fed. Yeah, we, we used to, set to tell that traditional semi-confinement, because the main feed was corn silage, yeah. but the cows even so would be on a pasture, on an extensive basis. Yeah, but an open pasture. Yes, yeah, open yeah. pasture. Yeah. And then the other question is, are you guys monitoring the biodiversity of your islands? Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that you are not monitoring anything from any standpoint. We have been Economic. working, yes, we have been working the last two years. Uh, we, we start with this hybrid diversity in the last two years, and you know it has been quite tough to get through this process. I mean, we decided all together, many farmers phew, takes, yeah. took a year and a half to design 
uh, what we call high, diverse, high diversity seed pastoralism. And I'm, you know, I'm very happy that I have, I'm not being presumptuous saying that that's a good way for this area. And also when the farm is realized that he can make some money just harvesting trees, that's also a good thing to move forward. The, uh, I should tell you, by the way, in Illinois, which I left in the year 2006, what we call rotational grazing, yes. was just coming in, meaning there was one farmer mm -hmm. within about 100 miles who was doing it. So even there, it was hard to introduce it. Yeah. But let me ask, uh, this is more intensive in the sense that you're taking off more biomass, the animals eat it and so on. Yeah. You may be taking off more nutrients, and then you also mentioned that at least one of your farmers wanted to start fertilizing with chemicals. So is there any concern here that when you increase this through flow of biomass, you're also taking off more nutrients? Yeah, let's, let's uh, <coughs> think about when you get milk, most of the milk, uh, I cannot go through this right now, but you have this perception that when you produce milk, we take lots off from the land, and I don't think that's true if you put the manure back on the land, because if you see, most of the milk is water, <laughs> a little bit is carbohydrate. Yeah, just follow. A little bit is carbohydrate. Where can the carbohydrates come from CO2? Well, it's a protein. Yeah, and the protein. And the protein is nitrogen that comes from the air with, in, through the clovers. So, you know, and uh, it's funny because a guy like me, the minerals, I was talking with uh, the minerals, is a little bit like this. You know, it's a 200 pounds guy, it's like maybe a pound and a half of minerals. So when we produce like 2,000 kilos of milk per hectare per year, what we take from the land, that's have been proven, can it be take back to the land just through the minerals? If the cows are on pasture all the time. And I have the figures here and I can show you. Yeah, and then if, if it's beef, it's even better because beef is, is, is fat and fat's carbohydrate. Well, the other thing you showed it is that the, the manure on this was on is absorbed much faster. So if you have the kind of extensive grazing that's all dry, the manure just sits there, gets washed off. If you have the hoys on, it's just sucked right back into yeah. the landscape much faster. Yeah. The farmers measure, you know, they measure. And, uh, and another thing that we have, many papers have shown that the organic matter on the field have been increasing quite a lot when you work with hoys and grazing. Uh, why the farmers are trying to use fertilizer? Because they realize that they can make more money to buy a new TV, a new car. It's just, you know, it's, it's just trying to get more efficient and more efficient and more efficient. That's the point. I don't think uh, many papers have shown that when you work with hoes and grazing, indeed, we will go over the soil. These guys. Instead of. Why don't we end here? Thank you so much for your time.